membership classes. We're going to continue now with uh, two hymns, May the Words of My Mouth and I Will Offer Up My Life. We know that we have assurance in an all-powerful and sovereign God. We know that He's in control of our life, and knowing this, let's respond with praise um, as we sing together. Let's stand to sing after the op introduction.
This morning, we're really pleased to welcome Jim Turrent back to speak with us from Central Baptist Church, Dundee. Jim, we've really benefited from your teaching before, so we're thank you, thankful for you to come back and speak to us again this morning. Thank you so much, uh, Duncan, and uh, it really is a pleasure to be back here in Belfast and with uh, you here in the Crescent, and I bring you, uh, as I always do, uh, the greetings of the church family in Central uh, Baptist in Dundee. Uh, we're grateful for uh, the fellowship that we have in the gospel. It's always nice to be in a place where there are a number of gyms as well. It used to be in my home city of Glasgow that if you shouted out, hey, Jimmy, half the population would turn around, but it's changed a little bit. Privileged to open God's Word with you. Let's turn to the book of Job and chapter 3. We'll read chapter 3. And then uh, I propose this morning to look at this in three parts. First of all, we'll be looking at the pain. And then we, we'll be looking at three opinions as we go through uh, chapters uh, 4 to 14, actually. Um, don't worry, uh, you won't need a flask and a blanket. Uh, we'll go through and, and just summarize the arguments, and then we'll come at the end to a perspective. So first of all, we identify the pain and what Job was going through, and then the three opinions, and then the sense of perspective that comes uh, to Job and is presented to us as well. Job 3. After this, Job opened his mouth and cursed the day of his birth. And Job said, let the day perish on which I was born, and the night that said a man is conceived. Let that day be darkness. May God above not seek it, nor light shine upon it. Let gloom and deep darkness claim it. Let clouds dwell upon it. Let the blackness of the day terrify it. That night, let the thickness let the thick darkness seize it. Let it not rejoice among the days of the year. Let it not come into the number of the months. Behold, let that night be barren. Let no joy cry, en joyful cry enter it. Let those curse it who curse the day, who are ready to rouse up Leviathan. Let the stars of its dawn be dark. Let it hope for light but have none nor see the eyelids of the morning, because it did not shut the doors of my mother's womb, nor hide trouble from my eyes. Why did I not die at birth? Come out of the womb and expire. Why did the knees receive me, or why the breasts that I should nurse? For then I would have lain down and been quiet. I would have slept, then I would have been at rest with kings and counselors of the earth who rebuilt ruins for themselves, or the princes, or with princes who had gold, who filled their houses with silver? Or why was I not hidden, stillborn, a stillborn child, as infants who never see the light? There the wicked cease from troubling, and there the weary are at rest. There the prisoners are at ease together. They bear not, they hear not the voice of the taskmaster. The small and the great are there, and the slave is free from his master." Why is the light given to him who is in mis misery and the life and life to the bitter e end? Who long for death, but it does not come and dig for it more than for hidden treasures. Who rejoice exceedingly and are glad when they find the grave. Why is light given to a man whose way is hidden, whom God has hedged in? For my sighing comes instead of bread and my groanings are poured out like water. For the thing that I fear comes upon me, and what I dread befalls me. I am not at ease, nor am I quiet. I have no rest, but trouble comes. Amen. This is the word of God. You know, our days are often filled with so many things, aren't they, with so much small talk about the weather, about the match, about any number of things that we face. Tuesday, 10 o'clock, is team time in Central Baptist and and sometimes when the team gather, I just let them talk for a wee while because it's good. Small talk is good. It's the oil that kind of lubricates social life, isn't it? 
And if, if I were to bring a recording of the team talk two Tuesdays ago, you would hear a discussion as I was listening to them that took place between the team about what constitutes the difference between a cake and a biscuit. <laughs> Apparently, a cake goes hard after a week or so, and that's the qualification for a cake over a biscuit. Well, small talk is fine. It has its place. It connects people. But aren't we glad that God has ordained that a book like Job is placed in his infallible words? Aren't we so grateful to God that a book like this, that deals with the depth, is placed in the canon of Scripture? Because here we move from the mundane to the profound, and I'm sure, like me, you are thankful. Uh, we watch the news. We ask ourselves the question, is anyone at the steering wheel of history? Who, what controls our lives? Chapters one to two that Jonathan looked at last time. See Satan challenging God, and God responds, but something absolutely essential happens in that initial interchange, and it is this, that our sovereign God sets the parameters, because that's what he is. He is the God who is sovereign. And before anything happens, he sets a providential hedge around his precious servant, Job. Please notice that. That's key for what comes later. Now, we know as we read the book of Job that it is Satan, not God, who causes the pain. But Job doesn't know this. He doesn't know that. And this adds to the agony. And so the question for us is quite simple at the beginning. Why did God allow Job to be tested? Well, the short answer is for the purpose of his glory and the blessing of Job and the wider company of his people. Through Job's experience, a picture of Yahweh, God of Israel, emerges that is puzzling from Job's perspective, but profound in what it reveals. There is, first of all, pain. Job wrestles with his knowledge of God and tries to weigh up his knowledge of God with the experiences that he is experiencing. Then there are three opinions. The, the, the three friends can easily be criticized, but at least they were there. But nevertheless, they bring suboptimal answers to what is being experienced by Job. But then finally, there is a perspective that this book brings. Job's experience, particular to him, yet brings perspective for us. And through Job and his experiences, we begin to discern the nature of God and of his redemptive purpose for his people. And ultimately, ultimately through trials, God's redemption is revealed and settled in the person and work of Jesus Christ, who like in every other book of Scripture is in here. I know that my Redeemer lives and that he shall stand upon the earth. And at the end of the day, Job's faith is confirmed. Job is such a helpful book because it presents huge questions with enormous implications. Isn't it wonderful that God's revelation doesn't run away from the big questions? But we must recognize the biblical parameters because there is much scope for under, misunderstanding here. God is not and never can be the author of evil. He cannot act against his nature. But God being sovereign does in a secondary sense permit evil. And if you find that hard, let me ask you something. Did you sin this week? Well, I notice that you've not been vaporized. God sovereignly chooses to bear with our sinfulness for the ultimate glory of his name because his purpose is redemptive. As B.B. Warfield in his book, Plan of Salvation, says, in the end, the creator must take responsibility for his creation. 
But this is with respect to its ends, and God, our holy and sovereign God, defines the ends. And in the end, we will have no cause to question Him. We will have no cause to question Him, because our God can bend back evil for the glory of His name and for the blessing of His people. That's seen supremely in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Though killed by wicked hands, yet through that experience of expressed evil comes the redemptive plan of God in Christ. Who or what governs my life? Well, spoiler alert, it's not karma or chance but a God of sovereign care. You see, at some point, as we grow as Christians, we come to a crossroads. And and one sign says, open theology, open theism. You know, when something bad happens, God is as surprised as the rest of us. That was the big thing 20 years ago. Or the other sign says, big God theology. God's got it. And I know which direction I want to take. First of all then, the pain. The writer does what many prosperity preachers try to avoid today. He presents a godly man facing agonizing pain. And this is the set, and this is set in the sovereign purpose of God. There is no cheesy, God has a wonderful plan for your life stuff going on here. This is real, it is raw, it is honest, to the point where Job opens his mouth and curses the day of his birth. I mean, it cannot get more extreme than that, can it? Why does a good God permit suffering in our lives? Well, this book is a gift to us because it gives us a glimpse of the God who is beyond our horizon. And like most, I would say all pastoral questions, the answer is hidden in the very nature of God. God is good. God is good. His attributes operate concurrently. He is, if you like, the ultimate multitasker. He he works with complexity. His ability is breathtaking. Eternity will reveal it. It allowed Joseph to say to his brothers after they had sold him into slavery, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good to accomplish what is being done, the saving of many lives. This knowledge allowed Paul to say in Romans 8, we know that all things, in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. It allowed David in Psalm 22, that wonderful messianic psalm, to say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And yet in the same psalm to say, yet you are enthroned as the Holy One. He understood that the difficulties of his life were set in the sovereign care of the God of Israel. What a precious thing that is to know. God's purpose in suffering for his people is ultimately redemptive, and we see that specifically in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. And for us, the suffering of the believer proves our faith, bringing us to Christ as we glorify God in the circumstances that we face. And let me tell you, in my job, I see that every week. I see that every week. I see people who live lives of quiet heroism, people who are struck down with various ailments, age and infirmity, and yet whose hearts are for God and whose prayerfulness is evident because they understand who God is and the circumstances in which he has placed them. Well, that's the pain. And it's important that we identify that because there is a stream of theology these days that would like to commit the idea to our minds that that God is just there to make us happy. No, he's not. He's there to make us holy. And sometimes that goes by the way of challenge and pain. 
So there's the pain, now there's the three opinions. You know, back in the day, there was um, a rock group called Travis, who, I need to stop doing this because every time I try to make myself sound trendy, it doesn't work. All my musical illustrations are about 25 years out of date these days. But th this song came into my mind when I was, I was thinking about this, these lyrics. They had a huge hit back in 1999 with a song called, Why Does It Always Rain On Me? Have you heard that one? Why Does It Always Rain On Me? Is it because I lied when I was 17? Why does it always rain on me? Even when the sun is shining, I can't avoid the lightning. You see, what's intrinsic to that lyric is what the friends of Job believe and express to Job. Whoever wrote this lyric was saying, is it something that I've done that means the bad stuff's happening to me? That's the way the friends of Job are thinking. They're thinking in terms of God and retributive justice. You do something bad, something bad's going to happen to you. And that's what they say. You've done something wrong, Job. But they could not have been more wrong because Job's heart is for God. First of all, there is Eliphaz. If you look at chapters uh, two to, uh, verses 2 to 4 of, of, of chapter 4, and, and, and I'm, go I'm going to ask you to pick up your Bibles and just scan this as I go through. It will be as quick as I can make it. Eliphaz starts something somewhat sympathetically. He says to Job, effectively, Job, you are a good bloke. You're not all bad. You're a good old stick. You've helped others. But he, it doesn't last long. He says that he knows how God works, he says. Remember, who that was innocent ever perished? Or where were the upright ever cut off? And you think, Eliphaz, you should have gone to spec savers. Because that's not the way the world works. Sometimes the innocent in that sense do suffer. Job, the problem is there's no smoke without fire. This is happening to you because you've done something bad. Eliphaz tells Job that he, would, he should accept the reproof of God so that he can move on. But what's wrong with this diagnosis? Well, it assumes Job's guilt. It lacks any sense of, of nuance. Job knows that he is innocent, not that he is perfect. His innocence declared here does not imply perfection. He's a, a man who knows what it is to sacrifice to God. So it's not about perfection. But the approach of Eliphaz just misses the mark. Now, it's easy to diss Eliphaz and the other two, but at least they're there. But what they lack is a sense of, of God and who God's work, who, the way God works, whose nature and ways they seek to represent, but in this, this instance, wrongly. And Eliphaz leads Job into despair, chapters 6 to 7, with some wrong think. But Job says, listen, a man, man is born to trouble as the sparks fly upward. Job knows stuff. He knows that there is a sinfulness that is pervasive in the world in which he lives. And we say when we listen to Job, this isn't the sound of a man with a seared conscience. Job says, verse 17 of chapter 7, Behold, blessed is the, the one whom God reproves. Therefore, despise not the, dis the discipline of the Lord. And then he goes on to say, chapter 6, verse 10, that was chapter 6, I'm sorry. He says, I have not denied the words of the Holy One. So he has this concept of God as being a holy God. And the question is, who is in control, Eliphaz? A God of retributive justice, cause and effect. You know, you, you step on that sinful wreck and it smacks you in the face. Is that what God is like? Well, of course there is cause and effect in terms of our sinfulness. There are repercussions that we have to face. But what about grace? What about the sovereign care of God? What about this heavenly perspective? What about the fact that God works operates his perfect characteristics concurrently and with complexity, but always for the glory of his name and the blessing of his people. It's much more complex than that, Eliphaz. Then up steps Bildad, chapter 8. 
And he takes on this retributive justice argument from Eliphaz, and he racks it up. He just assumes Job's guilt. He prescribes repentance. At verse 5 of chapter 8, if you seek God and plead with the Almighty for mercy, if you are pure and upright, surely then he will rouse himself for you and restore you to rightful habitation. Well, that's works righteousness. This isn't about the God who makes us righteous. It's about becoming righteous by what we do. Job is exasperated. His pain is real, but something isn't right. It's, it's almost as if the heavens are his brass. He, nobody seems to understand his predicament. What's he going to do? Chapter 9, verse 33, he says, There is no arbiter between us who might lay his hand upon us both. Oh, how he longs for an advocate who can speak on his behalf. This is a cliff edge moment. Job is exasperated. Oh, he says, if only I had a good lawyer, if only I had an advocate, one who can act on Job's behalf before God. Is this ringing any bells for you? You'll come back to that. 1 John 2, 1 is the hint. The God of Job operates all his perfect characteristics concurrently with justice, with complexity, but always for the glory of his name and the blessing of his people. And sometimes this involves taking us to the very edge of our understanding. We are, we are caused to question the deepest things of our belief system. This account of Job is extreme for a reason. Chapter 10, as Job teeters on the cliff edge, he finds himself expressing what he knows. That's so important because we live in a culture where people base what they do on what they feel. No, when we face the challenges of life, we, we rest on what we know not what we feel, because what we feel can change, but what we know of God from His Word never changes, because God never changes. Job teeters on the cliff edge, but he finds himself expressing what he knows, circumstances notwithstanding. He says, you have granted my life, verse 12, uh, my, and, and your steadfast love and your care has preserved my spirit. Yet these things you hid in your heart, I know that this was your purpose. He knows that God is life, that God is love. He knows that God is his preserver who brings a purpose to his life. Well, these are the two friends of Job, Eliphaz and Bildad. And then comes Zophar. I'm tempted to do my Sean Connery impression and say, so far, so good, but I won't do that. That'd be completely inappropriate. But it's really not so far, so good. The friends so far have been loyal, but lacking. So far racks things up further with an insult. Actually, Job, you deserve the judgment of God. That's what he's saying to him. Job, all the stuff you're voicing just reveals you to be a bit of a windbag. You blow hot air. Verses 1 to 3 of chapter 11. And then he follows with a theological slapdown. Verse 7, can you find out the deep things of God? Can you find out the limit of the Almighty? Well, no so far, but that's not what Job is asking. He just wants some answers. And that's okay. That's okay. Job's wor world has been rocked, absolutely rocked. The heavens are as brass. Job is human. He can't resist some, some sarcasm to so far, having listened to his wisdom. He says in chapter 11, and no doubt you are the people, and the, wis and the wisdom will die with you. In other words, so far, you think you're the last thing in wisdom. You are the last thing in wisdom, and it will die because it's not the wisdom of God. Catch on to yourself so far. And then into chapter 12, Job, still in the midst of, midst of suffering, 
says this, verse 13, with God are wisdom and might. He has counsel and understanding. With Him are strength and sound wisdom. And in the crucible of suffering that Job has experienced, made worse by bad theology, he says, chapter 13, silence. Let me have silence and I will speak. And let come upon me what may. Why should I take my flesh in my teeth and put my life in my hand? Though he slay me, yet will I hope in him. If God were to remove all the comforts of life, what might we say? You see, this extreme episode presents an emphatic message of hope in God, and it's inspiring. But he's still in the same circumstances. Chapter 14, he looks at a tree and muses that a tree can be cut down but sprout again, not so with a man. He says, verse 13 of chapter 14, Oh, that you would hide me in Sheol, that you would conceal me until your wrath be past, that you would appoint me a set time and remember me. If a man dies, shall he live again? And later he will come to his own conclusion based on his testimony, experience and knowledge of God. Chapter 19, if I may borrow from the next section, these words were engraved in his mind, for I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last he will stand upon the earth, and after my skin has thus been removed, yet in my flesh I shall see God. The God of Job operates all his perfect characteristics concurrently with complexity, but always for the glory of his, of his name and the blessing of his people, and ultimately for their redemption. You see what's been happening to Job? All the props have been removed. All the comforts of life have been removed. Everything for him has been stripped bare, and he stands before God. It's a very famous minister from Dundee. His name was Robert Murray McShane. And he saw revival in his day, and one of his comments was this, that what a man is on his knees before God, that he is, and nothing more. And that is what we see in the life of Job here. All the props have been removed. His understanding of God has been challenged, but he holds on to the truth of who God is. So the pain, and the three opinions, and then the perspective. It's back to that. Sign in the road again. It's back to that sign in the road again, that crossroads. What is God like? Is he the kind of God who is surprised as we are, as surprised as we are with the terrible things that sometimes happen in life generally and in particular in our lives? Or are we committed to that big God theology? Imagine a terrible event takes place. Imagine a terrible thing takes place and some people in order, and this happens, in their pain, uh, refuse to believe that God is in this. I, I've faced this with people coming up to funeral services in tragic circumstances, and they'll try to say sometimes, well, that this was, this was not of God. God is not involved in this at all. Well, in one sense, this gets God off the hook, doesn't it? But at what price? God is reduced. He becomes less than the sovereign God revealed in Scripture. If God is not sovereign, He is not God. So not only is God reduced or diminished, but for those going through the valley of the shadow, all hope is removed. For how can you hope in a God who is as surprised at what happens in life as we are? That's not the God of Scripture. No, there is a mystery to the dealings of God, a mystery to the way He works that brings us to the place where we are laid bare before Him. And the true believer acknowledges Him. 
If evil events can surprise God and usurp his plans, then where is salvation and hope to be found? But God, being sovereign, bends back evil for the glory of his name and the blessing of his people so that with Paul we can say not that all things are good, but that all things work together for good to those who are called according to his purpose. God defines what the ends are and does so according to his character of goodness in such a way that we will not finally be left with the painful questions. Are you prepared this morning to leave those unanswered questions with the Lord? Are are you prepared this morning to trust him when to trust him is the hardest thing to do? Are you? The most important things that the book of Job reveals are about Yahweh. Out of his pain, Job exclaims that God is holy. Job says, I have not denied the words of the Holy One. And so Job knows, he understands that God would never, ever do anything that acts against his nature. So whatever he doesn't understand, this he does. That God is holy. Oh, he cries, there is no arbiter between us who may lay his hand upon us both. Step forward, the Word made flesh, our advocate before the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 John. Job understands that in ways that he cannot understand that God operates all his perfect characteristics concurrently and with complexity, but always for the glory of his name and the blessing of his people. God is magnificent. His purpose further is for his people. And his purpose for his people in pain reveals in them true faith. The words of Job 13 verse 15, though he slay me, yet will I hope in him. Oh my, how weak and insipid is our faith at times. Is that how we feel about our triune God? His purpose for Job and for us is never random, but is always redemptive. He's always doing something in our lives. And sometimes at the time we cannot see it. Sometimes we think our lives are over. I had a broken engagement in my mid-twenties. I thought my life was over. Brokenhearted. Could hardly lift my head off the pillow in the morning. I look back now and I see the blessing of God in that experience. In Job, this redemptive pattern is worked out in miniature. But it's worked out in magnificence in the cross of Jesus Christ where what seemed to the watching world to be an ultimate and unmitigated disaster proved to be the greatest victory this world has ever seen. Death is dead. Love has won. Christ has conquered. And yet, Job is still left with pain, isn't he? Oh, the... Again, spoiler alert, the ending is good. But it's not a kind of Pollyanna-type ending to Job. Everything's just happy and jolly. As God restores all things to him, he still has the loss of all that he has lost. And that pain still stays. And he and we are still left with questions in our lives, aren't we? And you know, properly framed questions to God are okay. Read the Psalms. But the main questions are answered in the nature of God's. God's sovereign care. His ability to redeem his people in their circumstances for his glory and their blessing. 
And that's really, really pertinent for us today. In a culture where some social media preachers invert scripture to make people sovereign and not God, we see how dangerous that is. So people are told if you can believe something, if you can believe something, it will somehow materialize. What an inversion of scripture that is. We are not sovereign, God is, and we are at our best when we recognize that, and we bow before our sovereign God. We absorb the implications of this account, and we find stability in our lives and in our circumstances. I remember my Auntie May when she lost her husband. And she stood in the midst of the home and she reminded us of what Job said. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So we absorb the implications of this account and we find stability in circumstances. And the hope that rests not in our ability to believe something into existence, but to rest in the goodness of God. Oh, to rest in the goodness of God. garrisoned by good theology. Oh, good theology saves us from so much pain. John 9, Jesus is walking through a town, and as he went along, he saw a man blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus said, neither this nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, as a result of what happened, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. God owes us nothing. Pain is real, but God is a purpose. God operates out of his perfect nature. He proves his grace and his people's faith in their suffering. You think about some of the extreme experiences of your life, bringing you to that place of worship. Why did God allow Job to be tested? Answer for the purpose of his glory and the blessing of his people. And through Job's experience, a picture of Yahweh emerges that is, yes, puzzling from Job's perspective. We don't have all the answers to everything that happens in life. But what we know is what we know that God is sovereign and that he is good. Job wrestles, not just with his pain, but with those three opinions. And yet he leaves us this wonderful perspective. Through Job, we discern the nature of God and his redemptive purpose. And ultimately through trials, God's redemption is revealed and settled in the person and work of our Lord Jesus Christ. And know that my Redeemer lives and that he shall stand upon the earth. And like the old country and western gospel song, we say, where can I go but to the Lord? Not only was there a rock song running through my mind as I was studying these passages, but also Joseph Parker's famous hymn. We don't sing it often these days. Maybe you do, but we don't in Dundee. We need to sing it more. God holds the key of all unknown. And I am glad. If other hands should hold the key, or if he trusted it to me, I might be sad. I might be sad. What if tomorrow's cares were here without its rest? I'd rather he unlock the day. And as the hours swing open, say, my will is best. My will is best. The very dimness of my sight makes me secure. For groping in my misty way, I feel his hand, I hear him say, my help is sure. My help is sure. I cannot read his future plans, but this I know, I have the smiling of his face and all the refuge of his grace. While here below, 
while here below. And then he closes off with these words, enough, this covers all my wants and so I rest. For what I cannot, he can see. And in his care I safe shall be, forever blessed, forever blessed. God is good. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you and bless you for all that you are. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we adore you. And we are so grateful for your saving work and your redemptive purpose in this world and in our lives. And I pray for my sisters and brothers this morning some of whom perhaps are going through really, really tough times. And all of us, Lord, in this sin-sick world can look back on occasions when we have felt the weight of our sinfulness and of the sin that surrounds. We thank you that we have proved your sustaining grace. In times past, and we pray that we would prove your sustaining grace, into the future also, that we might worship you more deeply and be even more grateful for our Lord Jesus Christ who entered into our suffering to make sense of it and to be our Redeemer, our Lord and our friend. We give you thanks in his name, Father. Amen. Thank you, Jim. We're going to sing a final hymn in response to what we've been hearing. The chorus of the song Forever Jesus says, So for all my days I will sing my praise to the King forever Jesus. Though the storms will rage, he is strong to save. He is the king forever, Jesus. Let's sing of Jesus, our arbiter and our redeemer, together after the introduction.
Amen. Thank you for joining with us today. Please do stay for tea and coffee down in the cafe to my right.